Uh, welcome to uh, Children's Health Council. Uh, my name is Dr. Ramsey Casho. I'm the Chief Clinical Officer here at CHC and also a psychologist. Uh, you are at a wonderful training this evening, which is a community panel on navigating mental health services for your child. Um, you are in for a real treat because we have some amazing experts here with us tonight um, who are very well seasoned and who've been in the community for a very long time and to, can help us really shed some light on um, the mental health system of care for kids. But before we go into introductions and start the panel discussion, I'd love to just go over some um, housekeeping items. Um, this um, panel will be recorded um, and we will put it up on our Community Connections website, which is the name of the program in which we have all of our community engagement and workshops. Um, so you can find a ton of resources on our Community Connections webpage at CHC. So feel free to check that out. So for those of you who don't know, CHC has been around for 65 plus years. Um, we are a nonprofit. Uh, focused on serving the mental health and education needs of kids, teens, and young adults. And we want what all of you want for kids and teens and families, which is to be happy, to stop hurting, to feel better, and ultimately realize um, many of their dreams. Um, we have a vision in that we do see the promise and potential of every child, teen, and young adult. And our mission is to really help lift those barriers um, so that young people um, can be resilient, um, happy, and thrive at school and at home and in life. Um, and we do that by re removing some of the social emotional barriers that impact young people, regardless of language and ability to pay um, and location. Um, this is a sort of CHC model of care. This is how we understand young people. We really look at academic skills, mental health and wellness, physical development, and learning uh, how to learn, which many of us are also now referring to as executive function. And we believe that if we look at these, three, these four components um, and we help to improve each of these areas, um, we will have a happy and resilient child. These are our four areas of expertise. We have four divisions, um, clinical services, community connections, which I mentioned. We have two amazing schools, Sand Hill School and Esther B. Clark School. And we are a safe space for the LGBTQ plus community. We do wanna let you know about EdRev Expo, which is happening at Oracle Park on May 4th. It's truly a celebration of the one in four with learning differences and attentional issues. Um, there's gonna be workshops, there's gonna be trainings, there's gonna be fun activities. Um, we typically have thousands of people that show up for this event, so I would really encourage you to attend this event, particularly if you're interested in navigating mental health and, and learning differences in youth. Um, and some of our upcoming parent education events that you might be interested in, um, on April 9th, self-advocacy skills for, for kids, we're gonna have a teen panel, so tonight's our adult panel. We'll have one with teens sharing their own experiences. And then April 16th, one that you can resonate with all of you if you have a teen, Sleepy Teens, what is really going on? And we have a um, expert from Stanford uh, who'll be sharing um, their knowledge and expertise with us here. So please join us. Um, and also, we are always looking to improve our community education talks and panels. So please do fill out the survey at the end of today. Um, you can get the survey at the front desk as you leave. Um, we really look at those surveys and we use those surveys to adjust our talks so that they can be more beneficial to the community. So please, please, please fill out the surveys. We have an amazing panel today and rather than me reading through pages and pages of um, bios and amazing, amazing work that the panelists have done, I'm going to let the panelists introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Steve Sust. I'm a early career child and adolescent psychiatrist. Uh, I was originally born and raised in Philadelphia and currently hiding from the cold here in the lovely West Coast. Um, and uh, I went to college at this tiny school in DC next to the White House called George Washington University. I was a psych major, uh, non-traditional med school applicant because I took five years off in between uh, college and med school. And then when I ultimately got to med school, it was at University of Virginia, another tiny school outside the DC area. And I did my psychiatry residency at the University of Pennsylvania. 
And then I came out here to Stanford for, for my child psychiatry training. Uh, and getting the chance to work in the community has been one of the true blessings of being here. And it's so inspiring to sort of see so many parents here on a Thursday night listening to us talk. So I cannot wait to hear what questions uh, people have. Thank you. Hi, my name is Trenna Sutcliffe. I'm a developmental behavioral pediatrician. Um, some people are familiar with that uh, specialty, but um, it's actually an, um, a specialty that a lot of people have not heard of because it actually is a fairly young specialty in the field of medicine. Um, but it's a specialty where um, pediatricians do additional training um, in the area of child development and behavior. Um, and uh, in this specialty, we really try to um, do a true like biopsychosocial approach where we look at biology in addition to um, uh, social, emotional, mental health, learning, community, and really try to look at the whole child um, as we do assessment and create treatment plans. Um, I'm from Canada, and I'm sure it'll be obvious when I say a few words later on. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm Canadian and uh, trained in Canada um, at a large hospital called the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Um, I moved to the Bay Area 15 years ago and initially worked at Packard Children's Hospital in Stanford. Um, then we spent some time over at Paula Alta Medical Foundation, but I started my own clinic about five years ago. Um, uh, my clinic's in Los Altos and uh, created a multidisciplinary clinic um, focused on developmental behavioral pediatrics. And in the clinic, there's myself. Uh, there are psychologists on the team. We do a lot of assessments. Um, we have uh, teachers on the team, we do a lot of educational therapy, uh, we do talk therapy, family coaching, uh, parent coaching, school advocacy. Um, so we have a multidisciplinary team there. And one of the key things we do is we love to collaborate. I collaborate a lot with uh, people here at CHC um, and other therapists and uh, organizations throughout uh, the Bay Area. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tina McAdoo. I'm a pediatrician at Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and um, also I'm from Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And uh, went to school back east for college and came out here in counseling psychology at Stanford, and then decided to switch into medicine and uh, stayed at Stanford for medical school and joined the Palo Alto Clinic after that. Um, I've been on the board here at CHC, and I'm still here in an advisory uh, position, occasionally, voluntary. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, what else can I tell you about myself? I'm happy to be here with you all. It looks like most of you probably have adolescent children. Um, I, I have a special interest in adolescents, so it's nice to see you all here. Hi, I'm John Van Pierre Dixon, and I am a licensed marriage and family therapist, but I currently work as the mental health and wellness coordinator at Gunn High School. Um, I went to UC Riverside undergrad and USF for grad school, and um, majored in counseling psychology with an emphasis in marriage and family therapy, which I feel like is a big mouthful, but <laughs> <laughs> all just around therapy and counseling. Um, I started in community-based mental health, so I worked at the Wilson Center, Community Solutions. I live in San Jose, um, so that's where most of my experience was. And then I had the opportunity uh, to get to work in schools. And so now I'm at Gunn. I've been there for two years. Well, thank you so much for those introductions. Um, I've had the pleasure of being able to um, interact and, and coordinate and, and talk about clients and talk about the community mental health with um, these four folks. And it's really a, a privilege to have the four of you here. So thank you for making the time again. Uh, the way that we're going to uh, set the evening up is um, we think that it's best, we have some questions, and the questions that we put together are the ones that uh, collectively we have heard most often from parents. So we're going to start off with these questions. I'll ask the questions to our panelists, give them an opportunity to respond. Um, and then what we're going to do is open it up so that you all can ask the questions that you have. And so we find that it's best that we um, go over some of these questions and then open it up versus having a mix, because sometimes when we start chiming in, when the panelists are talking, um, we can go down amazing rabbit holes and we'll probably get through two questions. So 
Um, I want to make sure that we get through these rich list, list of questions and then definitely want to open it up. If you have a burning question, follow-up question to one of the questions that I asked the panelists, feel free to raise your hand really, really, really high and maybe we can ask one question from the audience um, that's related to these questions. Does that sound like a good, good plan? Okay, great. So we are going to start off with a question that we hear a lot about. And correct me if I'm wrong, panelists, but sometimes when I go to a dinner party or an event and they ask what I do, the conversation turns very quickly into, well, let me tell you about my child. And they often ask, well, how do I know if my kid, is this normal behavior or is, is there something going on? And so um, that's the first question is, a lot of parents want to know, um, does my child need mental health services? Um, and if so, if they're not sure, who do they talk to? And if so, what level of care does my child need, given some of the, the, the issues that are coming up? So, um, so again, how do I know my child needs mental health services? Where do they turn if they don't know who to talk to? And what level of care does my child need if I'm concerned? I'm going to start with this because I think the first place to start, and, and Genevieve and I are going to talk about this, would be either at the school or at your pediatrician or doctor's office. Your doctor knows your child really well. I've known my patients since most of them since they're babies, so I watch their development all along and I check in at the younger ages with the parents about how they think that child's doing. How do they manage discipline? How do they manage anger, outbursts? Does the child have friends? Is the child talking? So I, I think the whole time it's a collaborative relationship, first with the parents up until maybe 10 or 11 years of age when I can even meet with the children alone at that time and start talking about how they're feeling about their family relationships, how things are going at school, are they happy. Um, it's amazing how much children and adolescents will share with me. They're very honest. And I um, don't think there's any one time that, oh, now you need to go see a mental health, like it's a big decision. I think it's best to be proactive. So anytime you all are feeling, boy, I'm having a hard time with this. I'm not getting along as well as I want, or I don't think she has as many friends as she wants, or he's not doing as well in school as he used to. I think that's the time to either talk to the school or talk to your pediatrician um, and, and uh, explore with them whether this is normal behavior, whether there's some things that they can tweak just with our advice. Uh, and see how that works and check back in. Um, I usually would recommend starting with uh, not a psychiatrist, a psychologist, or a, a family therapist, social worker, just to see how things are going and if they think that things need, well, we're very lucky at the Palo Clinic because we have a social worker right embedded in pediatrics. So if I have any concerns, I say, why don't you check in the social worker and see whether he can help you with this or whether it needs to escalate further. Um, sometimes parents will ask about medications at that point and whether they should see a psychiatrist, but I think we're going to get into that later. I would say the school is, is always a good place to start, um, especially because we are we provide kind of a lower level of care. So we're kind of the first line of defense. Um, so if you do see different changes in your child or feel like they could just use someone to talk to, checking in with your school counselor is a good place to start. And within all the public schools in Palo Alto, almost all of them, I believe, um, have some sort of therapy embedded in school. Um, so Cassie, which is Counseling and Support Services for Youth, is contracted with all Palo Alto schools um, from elementary K TK-12. Um, so you do have access to therapists within school. Um, and your school counselor or even I think at the elementary school it would be the school psychologist is the person to talk to about getting linked to that support. Um, I'm just going to echo one more thing and kind of touch on the idea about level of care mm -hmm. as well. Um, just to emphasize that um, because the question's about like, when do I know my child needs mental health services or behavioral health services? And for some people, 
when you start thinking about that question, that question actually for them feels like scary or you're like, gosh, I'm thinking about this. This could be scary. And I just want to mention that, you know, and I love the idea that we talked about being proactive because the idea is if, if you're thinking about it, if there's something going on, there's a red flag where you've noticed some change in like the social dynamic or some change in mood or school grades, there's something going on. If you actually are thinking about it, then there's, it's a good time to exactly go to your pediatrician or the family doctor or talk to a teacher. And it doesn't have to escalate to a high, high level. It could be something, it's just about like connecting and having a few visits with the doctor, the primary care doctor, and maybe that's what was needed. Or there's community groups, or you know, there's um, if you're part of a religious group, something there that might be useful. But once you start to do that and talk to the teacher, the pediatrician, then you find out whether you do need to do more visits with a social worker or a therapist or something else. But I just want to emphasize there's so many levels to this, and the important thing is to be proactive to ensure good, positive mental health, behavioral health. So it's okay to be proactive and think of it as, you know, if your tooth bothers you a little bit, you see the dentist, check it out, you have some visits, some cleanings. It doesn't have to be the root canal, but I just want to let you know that there's levels. If you do need more significant help, then there's, these are the people, your school and your primary care person who are going to guide you to figure out who the right people should be to help you. But I just want to emphasize that if you're thinking about there might be something, um, it's important to feel comfortable to seek somebody to help you figure out just, again, some maintenance and some monitoring. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that point. Um, as you all probably know, there's a shortage of child psychiatrists all across the world. Uh, and even though Stanford puts out nine child psychiatrists graduates per year, you know that, that's still not enough. And so uh, I think one of the things that we as a field are starting to think a lot more about is the idea of early identification intervention. A lot of times when people are coming to my office, things have snowballed to an appreciable size. And I'm, I'm frequently wishing there was some technology to go back in time and to try to uh, intervene a lot earlier. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important, it cannot be understated how important, uh, you know, reaching out for help and just asking somebody and just bouncing ideas off of, off of people. Uh, I think that's something that we don't necessarily do as much of. And, you know, in the hopes of us as a community helping one another, wouldn't it be nice if we could actually just talk to somebody like a school counselor, a primary care doctor, or even a child psychiatrist who happens to be at a community event, you know, it's sort of like, <laughs> why, 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 why are we making this so hard? And and you know, is there a way to talk about things early? Again, with the hope of trying to capture uh, any 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 problems early on, rather than again things getting worse over time. That's great. I just want to add two things. Um, the other thing that I know CHC is doing, and some other community providers are doing, is we offer free. 30-minute parent consultations, because we know that parents want to talk to somebody, but they're not ready to commit, and they might be tentative. They're hearing one thing from the teacher, but hearing something else from their neighbor, and they just want to run it by somebody who has some knowledge and expertise. So um, a lot of providers, you know, CHC and a lot of providers are doing that in the community. And, I, you know, I always tell parents, you are the expert in your own child. Listen to your parent gut and intuition. If you feel something is going on, talk to somebody. You never, ever have to do this alone. Um, consult people that you trust, just like these panelists are suggesting. Teachers, pediatrician, um, uh, pastor, uh, whoever it may be. Um, call for a free consultation, whoever. Just talk to somebody about what's going on. The other thing that I want to mention is level of care. Sometimes um, it can be very confusing. Um, at a very high level, very kind of basic level, um, the more impacted a young person is, and the more severe or higher risk the symptoms are, the higher level of care that they'll need and the more providers that they'll need. Um, if it's mild, if the symptoms and the challenges and the way it's affecting their day-to-day -day functioning is more mild to moderate, um, it usually requires less level of, of intervention. All right, uh, we're gonna go into our next question. What are the most common barriers to seeking treatment? 
We hear a lot about this in the community. Um, so there are definitely a lot of barriers just in general um, around stigma, around what it means to be a person who has issues around their mental health. Um, and there are also cultural implications to that. I can speak for my own culture. Even just becoming a therapist within my family was a really big deal um, and isn't respected by a lot of <laughs> my different family members. Um, and that it is a very intimate thing that occurs um, and a conversation that we usually keep within our family um, because it does become about dynamics and different things that are going on within the home and that it doesn't always feel safe to step out and to talk to someone that we don't know uh, about those issues. Um, and on top of that, it could be just your schedule and the things that are going on, like your kid is in soccer and in theater and in all these different things and trying to find one more hour to fit in the week to get them that support can be really difficult. So trying to reprioritize things and figure out how to get them the right level of support. And on top of that, um, even kids can just be generally resistant, where you may be like, yes, this is support that we need, and I'm prepared to get that, and I'm happy to go to these meetings, but my kid is not ready to do that and won't show up. Um, and needing to provide them even more support to help get them in the door um, can be another barrier and things make things difficult. Yeah, I, th I think Genevieve hit on most of the things. That flipping it around a little bit, a, a barrier that I run into is a parent will come in and talk to me about an issue that they're concerned about, and I suggest that they see a therapist, give them some names, and I see them for the checkup the next year, and, I'll, and they'll come up with the same concerns that are escalating a little bit. And I said, well, did you see the therapist? Uh, and no, because it got better. Things got better. And then it got worse again. And, and I just would encourage you as parents that if, if you and a teacher think something is going on, that I would go ahead and, and get that care early. It's back to the proactive. And, and not just think, oh, I think it's a little bit better this week. I don't think we can get by without doing that because the schedule's so busy. Or m my spouse doesn't think that this is necessary or it's too expensive or hard to find somebody it's very hard to find mm -hmm. therapists so there are lots of barriers that kind of let it drift on and then suddenly it's a year later and things are a little bit worse yeah sure um yeah there's a, a, a long there's actually unfortunately a long list of barriers that people can come up with um i'd say um uh, if you're thinking that you would like to s find some support with behavioral health, mental health, and you're, you think you also there are some barriers in the way, I would, um, one option is to talk to other parents and see how they, what, th what kind of solutions they found as far as locations, how do you navigate, um, and so there's parent groups, and that's, that, that's the point I wanted mm -hmm. to make, was that there's a lot of parent groups. I'm sure there's uh, groups here, parent mm -hmm. support groups. I yeah. know there's some at Stanford. There's lots of other organizations, Parents Helping Parents. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of organizations where they, there are parent groups. And I think that's a good way to also realize you're not alone. Um, and so I think that's another, uh, another thing to think about. You're not alone. Um, there are, it's amazing once you start going to some of these groups to find out how many other parents are having very similar situations and maybe experiencing some of the similar barriers. Um, so I think that's a, a great way to get the conversation going and think about um, how to sort of navigate. Um, just to echo on that, there, there's a lot of fantastic community resources here in the Bay Area. Mm -hmm. Um, e even NAMI Santa Clara, they have this warm, so NAMI stands for National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. And um, I know that sometimes there can be some hesitation to, to get in touch with them, but they've run a fantastic warm line that is a very up-to-date listing of all the community resources that are out there. And they also run parent support groups. Um, it, it is fantastic how much uh, they've actually They've collect how much information and resources they've collected in Santa Clara County, um, and if there is any question about what's going on, there would absolutely be a great place to even start. Um, the National Alliance for the Mentally Ill. It, it's uh, each county has its own sector, or sorry, sector, so, uh, chapter, and um, 
here, this is Santa Clara County, and so San Mateo County has their own one, but each one around here has a warm line. And uh, there are parent resources there as well. Um, one thing I did want to touch upon slightly that kind of relates to what Genevieve had said before is that uh, it's important to remember for youth, they're at a stage in development where they're trying to come to understand um, what they're good at and what they can, what they what their strengths are, and um, part of that growth process makes it difficult for them to reach out for help sometimes. And part of the reason why sometimes they might be resistant. Um, and if, if that is the case, I think it's important to really sit down and have a conversation with your child about uh, what their perception is of what's going on, and just trying to get to understand them. I, I think a lot of times it's difficult to reach out for help when you don't know if anybody really understands what's going on. Being able to have that connection with somebody, being able to understand that somebody knows what's going on and is listening to you, that's really important before you can actually go in there and say, hey, we should go do this. Um, there's more to it than that, but I think it's really important for you all as, as parents and concerned community members to really be able to sit down with the teen uh, when you're concerned and just be able to listen to them and try to draw as much information as you can. Um, getting someone to, to, tr to trust you requires listening to them for a long period of time and trying to understand what's going on first. So uh, that's what I would start with. There's a question back there. Those of us in the room had some inkling that we needed some information on mental health. How do we get the resources out there for the parents who don't even know who to ask? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. So the question is, how do we get some of the education and the materials around mental health out to people who don't know that it exists or where to even start to find it? school is <laughs> a really good place to do that um, because they should. Every, every school should have that information and if they don't, they can link you to someone who does. Um, their school counselor should be well versed in how to access that information um, and if they're not, then it's, it's reaching out beyond that. Um, your assistant principal's principal should all know or at least have some level of lists. Um, at least at our high schools, at Gunn and both Palo Alto High School, we have wellness centers. Um, so we have a whole wall <laughs> full of information. So at the high school level, there's a lot more access to that support. I know at elementary schools, it's not you know um, as widely accessible, but the school psychologist should have that information. And then middle schools, they're looking at expanding wellness centers into the middle schools in the upcoming years. Uh, but for right now, the school psychologist should have that information and the school counselor should have that information for you too. I agree, that's a great place to start. Um, the school is a is this fountain of, of information around, around here in the Bay Area. Very different from some of the schools that I, I may have grown up around. And um, I think you, you, you hit upon a key question, which is that a lot of people, when they're going through something, they don't necessarily recognize that there's a problem. But certainly, family and friends are noticing something's not, not quite right. And it, it's part of a, a, a slower cultural shift, but I do think that it's important for uh, people to have resources, and trusted resources in particular, um, where they can go to sort of ask some of these questions and start trying to figure out what resources are available, does this person need more help, you know, how can I help, how can I intervene? And I, I think there, there, there's obviously a more complicated question there, but um, I do think that it's important for uh, teens in particular to have a trusted adult at their school or a trusted adult in their life in general and someone who they can bounce ideas off of because, again, if, if um, there's something wrong, usually friends and family notice it and uh, sometimes there's a hesitation to say anything um, to the person directly, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have some place for teens to sort of ask, you know, what's going on? Have you noticed this about my friend? And, you know, what, what, what should I do? And so, the, again, larger cultural shift in terms of help seeking and attitudes towards help seeking, but certainly something uh, that, you know, we should be trying to, to, to demonstrate as we start to look around and try to get information and resources ourselves also. Great. Another thing in this community that we're really lucky to have 
are, that I can think of right now, three community health libraries. Um, Palo Alto Clinic has one. They always have somebody in there, uh, master's mm -hmm. level uh, person who helps you navigate uh, the internet, will get resources, uh, help connect with places like um, NAMI, mm -hmm. is that how you say it? Yeah. Children's Health Council, et cetera. Um, in Ravenswood, Ravenswood Family Health has their own library. Stanford has their own health library, and they're people that are just dying to have you come in because that's what their work is, otherwise they're sitting there doing nothing. Oh, I, I almost forgot to add one more thing. So, so um, one of the things that we've been working on w uh, at Stanford for the Center for Youth Mental Health and Wellbeing is um, this, this project with Santa Clara County. Um, there's, uh, th I didn't know this before I came to California, but there's a millionaire tax. So people who make more than a million, they get taxed extra and that money gets funneled towards uh, innovative projects. And one of the innovative projects that uh, we've been working on with Santa Clara County is building out what are called headspace centers. Mm -hmm. And so uh, recently that was approved and uh, there's one coming to Palo Alto and one coming to San Jose. And headspace is essentially a, uh, a community center on steroids. It has, <laughs> well, it has uh, a space where there's going to be therapists, there'll be uh, uh, you know, vocational specialists, there'll be primary care doctors, and it's essentially a place where you can go to get help confidentially and not having to pay at all. And so it, it sort of breaks down all of the barriers um, to potentially getting help. And so uh, I just want people to know that that's coming down the line. And uh, you know, if you want to talk more about it, I, I don't want to take up the whole, whole, the whole session talking about it. But it's not in place yet. No, no. It's not it's not place. So it the is question coming. is, who's spearheading it? And when, when is it going to open? Santa Clara County Behavioral Health Department is spearheading it. And it's actually. Um, in partnership with a lot of community-based organizations whose names, I'm, I'm not gonna name all of them right off the, right now, just because it's probably too much to write down, but just know that it is a it is a wide community effort to try to roll out early intervention models um, that have been innovative in Australia where there's a nationalized healthcare, um, and now trying to make it work here in a very different uh, healthcare system. Okay. Mary? Yeah. Um I'm not sure it's clear, but it's for teens. It's for kids. It's not for the parents. Yeah. So it's for yeah. you. The services are provided for the teens. The services are for the teens and the young adults. That's, this is true. Yes. Children, too? Just kids. Oh, I don't know what it is. I'd have to look back at the exact age range they'd stipulated, but. The age range? Yeah, what's the age? I, I, think, it's, I think it's 10 yeah. or 12. I'm not positive. Yeah. yeah I'll, I, I will look into it and we'll circle back. Great, thank you. Uh, so the other question that we get a, a lot and is a, is a, there's a lot of emotion around this question when it comes to um, parents making decisions around um, when it's time to medicate a child um, for mental health issues. Um, how do you make that decision and how might um, how might one deal with any concerns about medicating children or teens? So this question is for the MDs. All right, I'll start. Um, so when you, um, when a youth um, is working through a mental health condition, um, the overall treatment plan usually will con include multiple different things, and medication may or may not be one of them. So the important thing is to make sure you do have a comprehensive plan. Um, so that may include a number of things such as, um, so the ther individual therapy for that youth. They may also be involved in some sort of group therapy program as well. Um, there may be a parent component. Um, again, it's, uh, parents are, you know, um, need to support their child through this process. So there may be some sort of parent support component. The idea is that there's multiple things happening to support this youth with m their mental health um, and behavioral health. 
And though at some point, um, there's a discussion um, regarding whether or not medication should be part of that plan. Um, that discussion happens at a different time for every, every person, and every family comes to that discussion with different ideas and, a pro and uh, based on their own experiences, uh, whether or not they've had experiences with medications, um, what's happened to other family members in the past related to medications. So some families come to it where they feel very comfortable with that discussion, and other families, uh, again, have a lot of of fear or concern or questions, and questions and, and, and concern is appropriate. Um, and you need to make sure you're working with someone that you trust so that you feel very, very comfortable to make sure all your questions are answered. Mm -hmm. So deciding when that discussion happens about medication, it's, a, it's thinking about how much impact the mental health challenges are having on day-to-day -day life uh, social interactions, um, function, um, school performance, how they feel about themselves, their self-esteem and their confidence, mm. safety. There's so many different factors. Um, and so each case is so individualized, but it's really thinking about um, the goals of, of uh, the overall treatment plan um, and how you're progressing with that. So are you, is the youth able to actually access the, the benefits of therapy? Are they able to practice and follow through what they're learning in therapy? Are they able to, you know, so how, how successful is therapy being? So sometimes medication is needed in order to allow therapy to be more successful um, and help, help that person access um, what's happening in therapy sessions. So it's thinking about how um, how they're progressing. And so you work with a, um, a physician or you maybe also have the therapy team involved where you're trying to monitor progress. And if, you're, if there's certain goals that are not being met, um, then you're having a conversation about medication. And so you need to work with someone you trust to find out about what that means, pros and cons, side effects, what it looks like. And the most important thing is to be informed. And so gather information. And it's actually really important to gather that information, again, the word proactive, gather that information um, earlier rather than later. So if you know that this actually is an area that you don't feel comfortable with, actually then ask questions early on because you want time to read about it, think about it, ask another parent what was their experience like. Um, so I would say you want to gather information so you feel comfortable when you do have to make that decision, you feel like you have the information you need to go ahead and move forward with it. I, I agree with all of that. It's so important, the, the relationship, the rapport you have with the person who, who you're working with. There needs to be that trust. There needs to be that willingness to come forward and uh, talk about any of your worries and concerns because um, if that doesn't happen on both the parent and the child level, um, things don't always go so well. And um, there should be a very clear understanding of what the medication's targeting, what the family should be noticing as potentially different. Um, and uh, if your psychiatrist really does get the chance to really work closely with you, they'll even give you little questionnaires uh, to sort of rate how how, how anxious or depressed they might be, and then there's sort of like this, this, this uh, almost like a vital sign of sorts in terms of like how things are progressing in terms of severity of depression or anxiety. And so I think there's a lot to be said about uh, treatment and um, when to initiate it. I think for me, I, I agree, there's how, how disabling is it in your daily life? Is it Mildly, mildly disabling, moderately dis disabling, and you know when to initiate medications is a longer discussion, um, and it again depends on uh, whatever the presenting situation might be, um, because there are some conditions like ADHD where medications have been shown to be really, really good, and leaps and bounds uh, beyond uh, a lot of the ther the behavioral therapies that are out there, and you don't have to take the medications, but you know we should talk about all the different ways that the medications could be helpful and how it can make your life a lot easier, but you don't have to. Um, but it's again a larger discussion on what are we going to work on together 
uh, me as your doctor, and um, how do we do this in a way that fits with you and makes you feel like this is a medication that you want and that this is going to help and that this isn't me forcing you to take the medication. So mm -hmm. that's really important because once the child thinks that we're forcing them to do something, it doesn't go well at that point. <laughs> and so then it, it's, it starts a very, a, very, a very bad dynamic. But anyways, things that you might already know, but uh, just something I thought I'd throw out there. Um, the relationship with your psychiatrist is key. So as a, um, a psychologist and not a psychiatrist, I oftentimes do refer to a psychiatrist or developmental pediatrician or a pediatrician even to see if medications might be helpful or might be indicated. Um, oftentimes I do get some concerns about um, the referral. And what I oftentimes tell parents is you don't have to make any decisions in the moment. Just go meet with the provider um, the provider usually engages in what's called a medication assessment, where they're gathering information to determine if medications are indicated, and if so, what medications they might recommend. That will offer you the opportunity to hear um, a physician's thoughts about medications. It gives you the opportunity to ask any questions you have about the medications, share any concerns that you have. Um, and then you can make a decision any time thereafter. You do not need to make a decision right there in the moment. So um, oftentimes it's just going in for that visit and, and talking with the provider. I'd just like to, uh, to add one other thing. It's kind of the flip side. Most of the, my parents are concerned about starting a medication, but there's, there are a few that come in and ask me to prescribe it. Just uh, my child's quite anxious. Could you prescribe something for anxiety or something to lift them up a little because they're depressed? Mm -hmm. And I would never do that unless they're in therapy. Mm -hmm. They've got to have both sides of that. And then I just wanted to add something about, because you were talking about ADHD, because I was thinking a lot when I was answering the question a lot about, like, when I was talking about the therapy, I was thinking more of the mood stuff. And so the, those kids are, they definitely need to be in therapy. Um, we think about the mood stuff happening in addition to the medicine. Um, with the ADHD medication, um, again, want to emphasize that it can make a really big difference. Uh, but one of the things I talk about with families is one of the key reasons, if I am, if it is a case where we're working about treating, we're treating ADHD, one of the key reasons I do initiate medication is actually related to self-esteem. Mm -hmm. It's actually uh, not the great, like, it's not about what grade they have, or but it actually is about the level of stress at home. If there is a lot of challenges with parenting and that child getting a lot of negative feedback because they're being reminded constantly to control themselves and regulate. Like if you've got that going on, or at school, if they are always the last one to be done, always the last one with the red X's, we start to talk about self-esteem and we start to talk about how ADHD is a medical condition, and you would treat asthma if it if you had a child with severe asthma, and so and but but again, it's all about relationships. It's about trust with your physician, the people I'm working with. I know these families really well. I work with them like we have all sorts of other stuff going on, parent coaching, and all sorts of other things. Mm -hmm. But if your child is really struggling with self-esteem, mm -hmm. or and there's a lot of stress at home we need to have this conversation and make sure that the parents are informed of the choices. Thank you. ADHD is one that I yeah. would do with, yeah. I, I would <laughs> prescribe that without a therapist. Um, yeah. I was also yeah. talking yeah. about the yeah. depression. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so let's say we've kind of um, jumped some of the hurdles around stigma and we have a family who's in therapy or um, ready to have some medication. Um, and this, this happens quite some time. And they're, they're motivated for themselves and their child and their family. However, they're fearful about you sharing information with anybody else. Um, so sometimes we have families who say, um, please don't talk to this other person about what's going on. Or um, one that we get a lot of, and hopefully Genevieve will be able to answer this, is don't share this information with the school. I'm worried about the school finding out and the school knowing about it. So how do you address that as providers? So do you want me to start with the, uh, when the parent asks me not to share and then we'll go yeah, to you, okay? <laughs> let's do that. So I often get, a qu I often get asked, for example, um, you know, can you not share this with our school or my child's teacher? Um, so I commonly hear that. And so all I'll say is like, 
ideal situation, um, we are, there is transparency and we work as a team. So that's another one of my, like the take home messages tonight would be proactive. Another one is team. And so to make a difference, you need to be working on a team. That's parents, it's your physician, it's your therapist, and it is your school. That's the ideal situation. I do have families that have concerns for various reasons around sharing information with the school. So again, it's, this is a process. This is again about trust. And so we, we work slowly sometimes until we're at a point where we can share. But I will tell you that to really make a difference, there needs to be a team and transparency. And as far as what information is really needed by the school. So I feel like for a lot of the parents I interact with, there's a fear that once I come to the school and I start talking about what's going on, they want to know all my business. They want to know everything that's happening every day since they were five years old and all these different things. That's not necessary. Um, what the school really needs to know is what's happening right now, how does it impact them in the classroom, and how can we support them being successful at school. Um, so it's collaborating around what things you feel comfortable sharing with them and that you have the right to revoke that at any time. So if you come in and you're ready to collaborate and you're open about those things, but you feel like the team isn't supporting you in a certain way or you feel like people have more information than they should, that you do have the right to come back in and, and revoke that consent. And you have the right to choose exactly what things are shared and when they are shared and who they are shared with. Um, so we do have a tiered system, especially within the high school teams, within wellness where information is shared with me as the wellness coordinator, but that isn't necessarily shared with their individual teacher. Um, their teachers get very general information. Even when we have students that are hospitalized or are in very high levels of care, teachers may not even know that specifically. They just know the student was out for a period of time, and now this is their transition plan back into school. Um, usually the only time that their classroom teacher would really know the details of what's going on is if the student themselves reveal that information to the teacher. Um, they're close with them. They were involved some level or somehow in that hospitalization or major event. But besides that, teachers are not usually involved. The school counselor, again, will get now with our systems within the high school, they have access to similar information that I have, but again, it's still a tiered system, so they wouldn't have all of that information. And then with administration, they don't have access to that information unless it pertains directly to their safety on school campus. Outside of that, they do not have any access to their information about what goes on outside of school. So it really is a need to know type of thing. What if that security is breached? What is your recourse? So if, yes, so if there is any breach of confidentiality, that does become a whole conversation that happens at the school. So there are a lot of recourses for us individually as therapists and counselors, because we have our code of ethics and all those things, so we have to answer to that. The school counselors also have their set of ethical codes and things they have to answer to. Um, and then the school itself would, would have recourse around that with the district, most likely. There's another question right there. Um, a couple of things. Number one, I think it's important for parents to know that the for the initial assessment for special education, the more history that's there, the better the assessment and the, and the, um, the easier it is to, to develop a plan, an mm -hmm. IEP. Um, there's also HIPAA and FERPA that should apply completely across the board. Mm -hmm. right. Yes. Um, and then a problem with that is, in my case specifically, my son's teachers aren't allowed to see his IEP. Oh, what? 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 Because of confidentiality is what we're told. No. Oh. That's terrible. Oh, yeah. That's terrible. So that they need to implement I give it to them. I give it to them. Yes. 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 Implement the IEP. <laughs> yeah, I haven't heard that one before. That's it's pretty unique. Yeah, I mean, that, that is the time when most teachers do actually see, see the, information. the information because it's yeah. pertinent to the accommodations um, in the classroom. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and they're at the IEP meetings, exactly, yeah. exactly. And um, Genevieve, just real quick too, in terms of like the school, what's in the school record, sometimes we do hear, is this gonna affect, you know, when, when my child applies to college, you know, will these records go to the college? Um, are you gonna share it with any other third party? if a request for the CUME file, for example, happens. Yeah. 
So no, um, that information is not included in their academic record. If they have a formalized plan, like an IEP or a 504, that information does follow them for their benefit. So they have the ability to take that with them to college if they need that level of accommodation. But if there are any for our general education students or any events that happen within their school career that revolve around their mental health, that information is not included in their academic record. It is not shared. Um, and it does not impact their college applications. If they choose to write a personal statement about a specific incident that occurred and how they overcame that, we can support them in that, yes. Um, but it is only provided by the student and the family, not by the school. The school does not give out that information. And we don't, we're not allowed to. So if it does happen, that would be <laughs> a really big issue. Great, we have one last question and then we'll definitely open it up to, to all of you. Um, one of the questions that we oftentimes get is what are the difference in all of these different providers in the disciplines? Like what differentiates a licensed marriage and family therapist versus a psychologist versus a psychiatrist? Um, and what should one look for in terms of the differences between these degrees and does it matter? Um, so I'll just kind of break it down very simply and then would love to hear your thoughts. Um, all of us are mental health providers. Um, anybody can provide therapy services um, so master's level clinicians such as licensed clinical social workers, LCSWs, or licensed marriage and family therapists, LMFTs, can provide therapy, psychologists can provide therapy, psychiatrists are now providing more and more therapy these days and not just medication management. Um, in terms of medications, um, psychiatrists and developmental pediatricians and pediatricians are the only ones in the state of California that can prescribe medications. There are some exceptions in some states where psychologists get prescribing privileges because of a shortage. California is not one of them right now. Um, in terms of psychological evaluations and testing, um, psychologists are the ones that do that and school psychologists. There are some developmental pediatricians that also do um, psychological evaluations but primarily psychologists. Um, so those are a bit of the differentiators. And if you're just really going to somebody for therapy, the, the degree isn't really critical. You really just want to find a good therapist that engages in you know, solid, sound clinical practice, somebody who's recommended, you know, somebody who's, or an organization that's um, highly valued and respected in the community. Those things are more important over the degree. Yes. I was just going to say, I'm a, I'm a high school counselor. I'm an academic counselor. Mm -hmm. and, 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 and that's just to throw another yes, right. in, the, in the mix. So each and every one of the professionals that are here have different charges. My focus, the focus of my work is facilitating academic movement or progress. That's the focus of, of my work, the focus of the the social worker on campus who we work closely with would be the psychosocial need of, of the student. So each and every one of these people has different. Adding, adding on to that, I'm also a high school counselor, is that we're usually the first line of defense mm -hmm. because the teachers will yeah. say, you know, could you see this student? Something's going on. And at that point, we have to think, okay, where do we refer out? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do we how do we do that? Right, absolutely. Any anything to add on disciplines and how to make decisions about providers and I would say with therapy in general, that especially when it's therapy with teens and with adolescents, it's really about the connection with their therapist. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And for a lot of, because I see a lot of students um, that have had very difficult experiences with therapy, and so by the time they get to us, it, and they're in the wellness center, and it's just this kind of like drop-in, because we have drop-in hours, um, and they get the opportunity to kind of see therapy in a different way. Um, sometimes that can support them in re-engaging, but it can be very difficult. And with kids, it is kind of that first impression thing. If it doesn't work out, they're like, well, forget all of this. All of this doesn't work. Mm -hmm. No one's gonna help me. I don't wanna sit here and talk about things anymore. It's not helpful. Um, where in reality, it may just be the person that they're working with is not matched to them. Not that they're not professional or Appropriate, it's just not for them. Um, and helping them own parts of that and helping them kind of re-engage and find different ways to kind of come back to the work. 
I'm just gonna emphasize a couple of things that were said. So one about the relationship. So again, if you're looking for a private therapist, um, feel free to like interview and have, mm -hmm. and then your, your child should also, you know, make th this connection. So there is this process of making sure that it is the right connection. Um, again, the, when you're looking to private therapy, the actual degree uh, is less important than how many years experience they have and how much experience they have with the condition your child has. For example, if it's OCD, mm -hmm. you may want someone who actually has a lot of experience with that. Or So, so you ask again, it's the interview process, just to make sure it's the right match. Um, and then uh, making sure that that um, clinician does use um, like research-based, evidence-based approaches. Um, so for example, when we're talking about mood, we're talking about cognitive behavioral therapy, or we talk about if it's group, it might be DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. So there's lots of different, mm -hmm. you know, um, interventions that have a good lot of research behind it to that and show that they're proven to be successful when you're working with mood. Um, younger kids, it might be something called parent-child interaction therapy. If it, you have young kids who are working through behavior and anxiety, um, if there's trauma, then you want someone who has a trauma-focused CBT. So just it, these are, you know, make sure you ask questions about their approach, their experience, um, and that's the key thing, rather than necessarily the degree and the letters behind their name. Yeah. For private therapists. Yeah, this is true. Uh, a good clinician will be able to explain things to you in a plain English sort of way, and it should yeah. s it should make there should be some amount of sense that it makes, and there should be some level of reassurance that there will be measurable goalposts by which we're going to move or we're going to move on. Um, and uh, you know the, the the qualifications I think are something to consider, but not the most important thing to consider. Uh, I was going to insert a joke about you know me being in a lot more financial debt than probably everybody <laughs> else, um, and being early career and living around here is certainly not helping. Um, <laughs> but. Uh, but I, but I think the point again is that regardless of however much money I owe you as the taxpayers, you know my ability to actually uh, sit down with a family and to be able to hear what's going on to help help them uh, understand that you know I'm trying to help and that I'm trying to line up as many people around our common goal here, mm -hmm. which is you know I, I talk about. Um, this, uh, this idea of like self-actualization, there's a psychologist named Abraham Maslow who talked about hierarchy of needs. And once you've got all the basic needs, you'll then be able to become like the super rock star that you want to be at the top. We are all here tonight because we have that common goal for each and every one of the kids. And you know, how do we figure out how to connect with everybody in a way that helps to achieve that, that self-actualization? So um, I, I think, again, uh, it's important to find someone you trust. It's important to find someone who shares a goal with you and to try to, again, circle the team around the child. Yeah. So That's great. Thank you. Uh, all right. So we are going to open it up to the audience. And who has a question for our amazing panelists? Yes. With regard to funding for mental health services, 15 years ago it was all the responsibility for children's mental health for the um, county level mental health services. And then sometime in there, it's transferred to the schools. What happens with the students who don't have IEPs mm. and who can't afford private pay? Mm. Who's, where does that help come from? So here, um, <laughs> Palo Alto Unified at least, um, with our services within school are free. So Cassie, all um, counseling and support services for youth all of the services that are provided at school are free um, and accessible to them. If they have, they are usually for low to moderate need, however, but if we do have students or see students that are at a higher level of care or need and do not have the ability to access care outside of school, we still maintain and bridge them until we can have linkage to a program that does like sliding scale um, or has a scholarship opportunity. And then we work with families specifically to fill those things out as well. Um, especially when we have families that speak different languages and need additional support. Um, so those things are available. But it can, it is frustrating um, and it can take more time. But the hope is that the school can at least provide a bridge for that family until they can get to where they need to go. So I was just going to add to that, that in particular in the schools, um, they usually make a referral. Mm -hmm. 
And as um, both the our pediatricians up here um, said, that oftentimes or most of the time it is, unless it's at a higher risk or extreme risk, they're referred to a pediatrician in primary care. Um, and then at that point, hopefully they're in the insurance system at that time, and then they can go ahead and refer them to behavioral health. So that's probably one of the safest ways to make sure that you're able to get it paid for because, yeah, it's very expensive. I know CHC, I used to refer to CHC oftentimes. I know that they had scholarships as well. Yeah, they still do. Yeah, mm -hmm. and so for their consultations, and as Ramsey pointed out a few minutes ago, their 30-minute consultation, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people take advantage of that as well. Um, and Ramsey, if you don't mind, I wanted to give just um, the, um, her, the website for, sure. the, for the toolkit. Yes. because. Many of you might still have more questions, and this has been really very informative. It's Good. been really great, but you might have more questions afterwards. And there is a resource that you can go to that has a lot of information for parents, for students, to find therapists, lots of things in there. And it, there's also a section on FAQs that answers some of the questions that Ramsey was talking about, like what's the difference between a therapist or whatever. So um, I'll just give this to is Ramsey. Is hurtalliance.org? Yeah, it's um, slash help. Slash help. Okay, great. Thank you. Great. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll put it on our resource table. Thank you. No, uh, we'll, we'll put it up in the. Book. So I, I'd like to chime in on that question because I, you know, truth be told, we have to be able to admit that the funding is not good, um, and our system of care is not strong with regards to child mental health. The options now are county, school through I, I, IEP, school through just school funding, um, private pay private pay with sliding scale, so we do give sliding scales here, and many um, private clinicians also provide sliding scale. Um, County-based, I mentioned. Uh, private insurances. Um, the reality is it's not a good system of care. What we're doing at CHC is we're partnering with an agency called the California Children's Trust. If you are interested in funding systems of care for, for mental health for kids in particular, um, they're an amazing advocacy group um, that they are working at both the state and the federal level talking about this very problem and really trying to advocate and promote for a new model of care so that all kids are covered with regards to mental health. What is it called again? The California Children's Trust. They hope to be very short term. They don't want to be a long term organization. They're doing some really good, really powerful work. They're starting at the county level. Um, at, throughout the state, and then also our hope to tackle the private insurance sector as well. But uh, on a whole, really want to um, create a new system of care that is functional. You had a question. Oh, I was just going to kind of piggyback to all of that yeah. as well. And earlier, when we talked about what are some of the barriers and people seeking help, mm -hmm. I think that's a huge barrier. Yeah. Is it's expensive. Yeah. And when your insurance company may not pay for it, then you have to go out of care. And if you have a child who needs a lot, it can get very pricey yeah. doing it weekly. Um, and then you're fighting with your insurance company and you're paying out of pocket. And that, I mean, that's a huge barrier yeah. for people who just truly can't afford it. But you want to, yeah. yeah. So it's getting rid of that stigma as well for the insurance companies and fighting that these, you right. know, health insurance pays a little for this. Because yeah. it's just like asthma. Right, absolutely. More, more preventative as well, like cause I, I talked about the dentist earlier. Yeah. Like we get uh, your dental checkups covered. And this is, needs to be, that's like the idea of being proactive and being able to have maintenance and monitoring um, and it being, yes, uh, covered. Just like our child wellness checks. We should have child mental health checks, right? Um, one thing, I, one final thing to add on top of that is that if you have any complaints about your insurance, there's actually what's called an ombudsman in the state of California who's looking for your complaints, <laughs> <laughs> and they get they get lonely sometimes. Um, and I only found out about this because I work with uh, kids who have autism, and uh, that can frequently be a stumbling block at times. And so. Uh, I found a community-based organization that starts to talk about all of this. But um, essentially, you, you should look for the California Ombudsman on um, uh, just something about cons insurance and consumer affairs. I, I'll, if you want to talk later, I'll try to find the information. But certainly, you should not be afraid to uh, speak up.
with your insurance company? <laughs> well, no, it's, it's, well, I mean, no, it's paid for, for by your California tax dollars here, so I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's supposed to advocate on your side and, again, provide some level of accountability for the different insurance organizations that we are giving the green light to operate here in the state of California. So, Thank you. That's a good it, resource. It's hard with insurance, though. I, I try to refer my patients to, to their insurance to find out who's covered, and they get a list. And I look at the list, and half of them are for adults or I have not even practicing anymore, yeah, right. and the rest are closed. It, yeah. It's really a problem. And, and w it, as what you were saying yeah. back about interviewing different yeah. therapists and finding the right one, I mean, my patients come back and say, you know, I've called 50 and they're all closed. Or they don't call back. Yeah, those that yeah, take insurance insurance are one insurance. insurance. Very hard. Mm -hmm. Or those even that, that don't. Can't get in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's really a problem. Yeah. You, sir, you had your hand raised. Oh, yeah. uh, in fact, to the barrier thing, mm -hmm. what if your child just won't go? It's <laughs> <laughs> great. Yeah. What if your child won't grow? What go? path to getting them on board to actually just going? They won't go. Steve, <laughs> it's a question for you. Yeah. Um, so, well, it always can you come over to yeah. <laughs> Home visits. At, um, at school, what the really interesting thing is, I think at, especially at our particular site, is that their friends will be the people that will encourage them to go. Mm -hmm. Because they will say, I'm really tired of you texting me and calling me <laughs> with these things that I cannot manage for you. And I need you to find someone that's going to support you. So a lot of the times it is their peer groups that will provide them with a little bit more support. And a lot of them will also be in support. Um, so we see that happen a lot where we'll have students that will come in and have support in the wellness center and we'll bring their friends into the wellness center and say like, hey, like I really feel like Susie could use like someone to talk to. And they're usually apprehensive, they always are um, at first. But when we get the chance to just kind of talk and have general conversation, um, and our advantage is that we have tea and snacks in the wellness center. Um, so we can kind of get them in for that. Um, so it's not that they have to talk to someone or have to be in the space and tell all of their business to all of us, but that there's another way to kind of do it. So getting that peer level support can be really helpful. Um, and some of my students that are super resistant, I always say like, going there and trying it one time. If it's just showing up and going one time and seeing what that looks like and that your parents are gonna go and they don't wanna go after work. Like no one wants to have to do all these things, but if we can just try one time and see what that looks like and the hope is that they have some level of connection with the person they meet with and will continue to go. But I think it, it is, it is very much a struggle um, for them to also just admit that that's support that they need and be willing to be open to having that level of support. Um, but I think their friends are a really good place to tap into, at least to begin with. I'm, I'm asking you this question. Um, could a father or a mother call you and have you go reach out to? Yes. So, yes, <laughs> everyone can always um, call us directly um, at the Wellness Center, and we are happy to pull students from class um, or grab them at different um, events that we have. We have outreach events that happen on campus. Um, we also have different mental health groups on campus, so other students will encourage students to show up as well. So there's a lot of different opportunities, and that parents are always welcome to call us and provide us with what's going on, um, and we can do our best to kind of meet them at school and see if that helps. We don't provide ongoing therapies, just like an assessment to refer to another therapist, right? So you don't do... So, so we do. We do. Mm -hmm. We provide ongoing therapy. It is short term in nature, so it's usually 12 to 14 sessions. So it's about a semester's worth. If at that point they are not able to connect to a therapist outside of school, they continue. So there's never a point where a child who has a need is not being addressed, is not being seen. We continue to bridge until we make sure they have an appointment, it's scheduled, they've met with that person, and then we terminate. Um, the only issue with that comes in the summer. So when school's over <laughs> and we're not available anymore, um, our hope is that we do our best to start those conversations about April, um, about where are we going, how do we get outside support, what does the summer look like for you? And for our students that don't have a therapist over the summer, we create a plan with them before they exit school. So they have safety planning, and they have, you know, who are you gonna talk to? Can you be open with your parents about these things? Who are your friends? We do all of that and then prepare for them to come back in the fall and they get set up again. So I know that that 
is, or for you, it's drop in, right? Kids are able to do that. Kids are able to drop in. Yes. Because um, I know this is IEP season. This is assessment season. <laughs> and our one school therapist is hopping. They get you know, so for yeah. a child who has a need to pop in, I don't know. I mean, I'm thinking, I've been thinking that they can't do that unless they have an IEP or a 504 because mm -hmm. this scheduling of time, just there's no room. And so what is a family to do? Yeah, so in those situations, for our particular site, our general ed students and our students that are served in special education have a variety of different avenues to get support. So our students that get support through special education have what's called an ERMS therapist, which is an educationally related mental health service. So it's separate from the general education student population. So they have a specialized person that they have access to all day. Every day. Every school um, has that or just your school? At the high school level, they do. Um, in the middle schools, I don't believe they have. Or in Palo Alto, yes. Um, is that both gun and Pali? Yes. Um, and that is it, it's at the high school level. At the middle school level, it is a little bit more impacted, um, where it is just the school counselor, school psychologists um, that are doing it in elementary, it's even more impacted because at that point they don't have school counselors, they just have school psychologists. So the higher up we go, the more support there is within Palo Alto itself. Um, there are other school districts that are looking to open wellness centers and provide that support. And San Jose Pioneer High School is one of them. Um, they're supposed to open their wellness center next year. I know Mountain View is working on theirs as well. So it is a model that is expanding out, um, but the hope is that we are able to address the needs. And even if we do, even in the wellness center, when we get inundated or overwhelmed or there isn't a person to meet with the kid right away, we write down their names, we find out a period that we can meet them, and we also do it on level of acuity. So if a student's coming in and they're in a high level of distress, someone is dropping something to meet with that student. Um, it's not being ignored, it's being addressed. Same thing with the parent phone call. If a parent is calling in distress, we're addressing that right away and finding someone to address that need. There's another question here? Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, oftentimes when kids engage in um, therapy, psychotherapy, um, they can vocalize. They have full language. But what happens when you actually have children on the autism spectrum who are not functioning, mm -hmm. but who also have language disorders? Mm -hmm. How do you, because it's that epidemic, that popular kids that pop, with, with this neurological disorders is mm -hmm. increasing, the population is increasing. How are you addressing that from both the medical as well as the school? On the school end, um, I actually used to be a um, ABA therapist, so I used to work with children impacted by autism. Um, and using some of those techniques can be really helpful. Not that everyone in the school is trained in those things, um, but those are things that we can support you in attempting to access outside of school. The hope is that I know at least at the high school level with our ERMS therapists, that they have more background in some of those things and can target that behavior um, and support it a little bit better, but that it usually is supported outside of school. We do see some of our, our students that are impacted um, and are managing those types of things within the wellness center and it just takes a lot more patience and time. And I think that it really depends upon the provider and the person they're interacting with. That can really take the time to meet with them and, and try to understand what's going on. And that if we can't, that we do then seek additional support. Um, we even meet with parents or bring parents in if we need more support in supporting that child. Um, I've even met with two or three students at a time. If a kid is really overwhelmed and distressed and is trying to express something, but their friend saw the incident or saw what happened or whatever else, then we you know, lean on their friends as well to kind of express or help them and support them in getting the support that they need. Um, so the autism spectrum population, uh, it, you know, it, there, there's a lot of support um, here in California, believe it or not, relative to other states. Uh, and um, I think you hit upon uh, a, a group, the high functioning, the high functioning autism spectrum uh, kiddos that that might have a little bit more difficulty uh, in terms of trying to find people who are who are knowledgeable and experienced working with high functioning autism spectrum population. Um, and uh, I guess at Stanford during training, w I was fortunate enough to have. Uh, 
supervisors who were actually able to provide a lot of that support for working with the autism spectrum population. But um, she's one of very few people, and she's actually retiring now that I think about it. Um, <laughs> but again, that not, that's not re re very reassuring, but um, I think one of the things that uh, is really important to highlight as a resource for the community is a joint venture between the Stanford Psychiatry Department mm -hmm. and the CHC. Uh, I forgot what ESPA stands ESPA, for. Early Support Program for Autism. There we go. Mm -hmm. um, they keep a very updated list uh, and repository of information for uh, resources um, for the autism spectrum population. Um, mm -hmm. And so I would definitely reach out to them, well, obviously early on if possible, uh, but also helping them to know about resources and support for youngsters who are about to launch into young adulthood. That is typically a a uh, difficult time for a lot of young adults uh, and trying to find support for them and trying to plan with them on that transition process into young adulthood is really, really important. I, I think the question is that I do have a lot of children on the autism spectrum do have some kind of metabolic, uh, if not, you know, mitochondrial um, dysfunctions. And some not, not all of them, but um, a good portion of them, you know, have com either they have a combination or one of the other, and some don't, you know. But the ones that do can't, they don't really benefit from the medication. Sometimes it makes it worse for them. So how do you, I'm, I'm wondering, like, with that population who are high functioning, have severe, probably more combination of different language disorders, can't really express themselves um, coherently and can't take these medication, how do you, how, how does therapy happen to support their mental health? I'm curious. Does anybody want to? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's no easy answer. Um, but it's, it's, it's about finding a therapist, it may end up being more of a behavioral therapist mm -hmm. than a, as you brought up, the ABA piece, but it, it's very individualized, and again, therapist means so many things, um, mm -hmm. as far as behavioral therapist versus a person who is doing more talk therapy, but it, it's someone, again, with experience in this area, and this is their area of specialty, and working with, with children with high-functioning autism, and helping them with, whether it's regulation, like, you know, emotional regulation, impulsive behaviors, reactions. Uh, um, I wish there was an easy answer, but it's, it's finding people, yeah. and again, using these, like, um, the resource you mentioned between yeah. Stanford and CHC to find a, a person who, this is their area of expertise. Um. Yes, back there. A couple things. Um, could you possibly bring some of your services down to your South County location? <laughs> I mean, like, really. Um, well, that's no noted. Thank you. <laughs> we, we, do ha we do have a South Bay location in San Jose, but it's not the full range of services, so I appreciate that recommendation. Um, also, we've come years and, and, and a long way in fetal alcohol syndrome, identifying um, mm -hmm. the symptoms and that kind of thing. Is there anything happening so far around meth exposure? Wow. Does anybody want to take that one? I'm not. It's not an area of expertise for me at all. Is anybody familiar with that? No. I, I'm not aware of any specific research that's looked at uh, the fetal effects of methamphetamines on uh, on uh, newborns. Um, and I, and I, and, I, and I'm sorry that I don't know the answer, that because that actually is something I run into a lot, because I also work uh, in the psych emergency room in Santa Clara County over at Valley Medical Center. Um, your, your question now makes me want to go read a little bit more about it and try to figure that part out, because um, I don't know of any particular uh, syndrome or um, nothing that I can particularly think of. Like cocaine, I, I know about cocaine heroin, mm -hmm. again, alcohol, but um, methamphetamines, uh, not so much. Yeah, Use even those, though nicotine. The medical library resources. Oh, you can go to, go to them and learn more. Thank you for the question. There's a question back there? Yeah. Is, I was wondering if you were aware of any um, special programs in our community available for kids with chronic um, 
medical disorders like congenital heart disease mm -hmm. or recovery mm -hmm. from brain tumor or various things that have ongoing needs with some anxiety and coping and then probably also some residual special learning needs. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm aware of a number of the summer camp programs mm -hmm. that are very favorable for their resilience, um, but it had trouble finding resources for the ongoing needs. There's a program, I'm not sure if it's exactly the right one, but there is a program over at Packard Children's Hospital, I think it's called HEAL uh, program that um, I believe um, they do have uh, like a, a social worker and a psychologist, yes. Yeah, that's a great program that, that identifies patient special learning needs mm -hmm. and can um, make some referrals, but then what, who to refer to, mm -hmm. you know, even from the Children's Hospital has been an issue. Yeah, and that's why I was wondering if you guys were aware of any other community resources. Mm -hmm. they, they don't actually do the therapy there, they, they just, just refer, right? right. Yeah. They just like put the parents and then they so I think you want to identify folks, psychologists, who refer to themselves as pediatric psychologists. Most of them have training in medical conditions and the interplay between medical challenges and mental health challenges. And so um, I know we have maybe one or two folks on staff that have that specialization. I know there are people in the community who do. You just have to find the sort of pediatric psychologists in the community. Yeah. Did you? Parents helping parents, those references. Great. Yeah. It's an unfortunate rare breed. Um, we, yeah. we have some psychologists, psychology students and trainees who rotate through our, mm -hmm. our, our hospital alongside the, the, the child psychiatry fellows. And um, the, yeah, it's, there's, not, there's not enough services that are out there. And trying to figure out how to you know, increase the network of availability, trying to figure out ways to make ourselves more efficient is one of the bigger uh, crises of my generation of, of providers. So we're going to take one last question here. Yes. I just have a curious question. If I'm a parent and I call in and I want a 30-minute free consult, what's the turnaround? Right. Uh, immediately. Within a, within a week. Yeah. Yeah, within a week. That's a good question because a lot of people have wait lists and there's concerns about that. That's something that we try to manage all the time here at CHC and I know a lot of agencies struggle with that. So we're always trying to to make sure that we're, we don't have wait lists that people can get in quickly. Because when you're ready to go, you're ready to go, right? So um, I do want to wrap us up here. I do want to say a big thank you to our panelists um, for being here this evening. So thank you. Thank you all for spending the time with us. We do typically hang out for about five to 10 minutes. So if you have some questions for us one-on-one, -on -one, um, feel free to come up here and ask us questions.